We're talking football. Of course, we're breaking them down. College football, NFL. We're handicapping some of the key games in week three in college football, week two in the NFL here on Playbook's Games of the Week with Mark Lawrence of PlaybookSports.com and the Playbook Experts YouTube channel. I'm your host, Greg DePama of the Art Lads Football Network and the Art Lads Football Channel. Thanks for tuning in. This is the show each week where we're going to go into games. We're going to talk about the point spreads. We're going to talk about uh, line movement. We're going to talk about the key trends to keep an eye on. And, of course, we're going to give you some of our picks and analysis. Mark, how's it going? Uh, w- w- what's uh, what's on your mind this week? Well, what would be on my mind would be a few more dogs to bark a little louder this week uh, than they did last week. But uh They'll get there nonetheless. I'm focusing on on those live dogs that I think can win the game straight up. All right. Well, as usual, we've got some of those. So uh, we're going to start off first of all. By the way, I'll be popping up on the screen during uh, this show uh, some of the key college football trends, some of the key NFL trends, and also uh, some of the uh, my best options as far as picks. I'm not saying these are my best bets or anything like that, but just the, the options that I think you could take a look at and decide for yourself if you, there's a few games in there that you also like. Uh, but again, we're going to start off with college football as we do each week. And there are some games coming up tonight. So let's go ahead and talk about that. Uh, you have that actually uh, tonight and tomorrow uh, yes. and, and really some good games. You don't usually get games like this on a Thursday or a Friday night, Mark, but you have uh, n- not now look, the Friday night games are definitely better. But overall, it's still going to be an entertaining uh, game, you would think, tonight between Arizona State and Texas State. And uh, Texas State uh, had a huge win last week over Texas San Antonio. Uh, your pick to win the conference, the Sun Belt, and they're off to a great start uh, with that blowout win last week. Uh, again, G.J. Kinney's done an excellent job. But this Arizona State team, you know, they've uh, look, they've been looking awfully good at home. I know they disposed of an SEC team at home last week. I'm a little bit surprised that that line has switched from Arizona State three to Texas State one and a half in just the last 48 hours. That's a lot of action. There's a lot of people then that really must like this Texas State team at home. I'm not so sure I would go that way myself, though. Well, you're talking to one of them, Greg. Uh, you know, in our newsletter, we called Texas State as a best bet when we sent it out on Wednesday when they were the dog. Uh, unfortunately, this game has gotten steamed. And uh, I think a little bit of that is because of the fact that one of my best angles is in this game and it is against Arizona State. And simply put, game three, you start out a perfect 2-0, and you beat the spread both games, and you're favored. Those teams have a real, real difficult time doing just that. We saw that last week when Georgia Tech went to Syracuse, same identical role. Ah. Okay. Uh, same role here for Arizona State against Texas State here tonight. And as you know, I'm a big G.J. Kinney fan here. I think he's done a great job with this program. I think he's one of the young and up and coming group of five head coaches that will be at a power five conference real soon. All right. But at this point, now that Texas State's the favorite, that, depending on how it goes, again, this is only a few hours before game time. It's looking like that trend is not going to count this week. Well, what I'll do is uh, I'll pull uh, one of my good buddy Jim Feist moves and plays in this game. And what he does is when you find teams that uh, you knew they were a dog and now they've gone to a small favorite, you don't like chasing, you don't like laying that favorite, what he'll do instead is he'll play this team on a money line. So okay. he'll lay he'll lay minus a dollar and a quarter, maybe a dollar and 30 cents on this team rather than laying the points. So that way, at least in your mind, you didn't bet a favorite. Uh, you just bet a game that was juiced. So I would recommend playing this game and pick them on a money line. All right. Friday night, we've got both Kansas teams uh, taking on two of the upstart programs of 2023, UNLV and Arizona. And as far as a dog, if we're taking a look at both UNLV here and Arizona, I would definitely look at Arizona before I look at uh, UNLV, even though Kansas State is the better team than Kansas, or at least that's that's what uh, is supposed to be believed here so far. And that is only because of the fact that, uh, you know, I, I know Arizona hasn't looked all that great out of the gates, but they're 2-0. and That's all that matters. They're on the road for the first time. Uh, but uh, we also talked about Kansas State uh, in our preview show about, I just don't know. I just don't know. And we kind of agreed that this is not uh, maybe as good as a Kansas State team as we've seen in the last couple of years, even though they have an electric quarterback. They're still a very solid team. They had a really good uh, win against Tulane. Um, and this Arizona uh, team, though, uh, they're just so exciting to watch. You know, Fafita at quarterback, uh, Tedaro at wide receiver, McMillan. Um, I think it's worth 
looking at the money line there because you're getting a little over two to one on Arizona. And so I'm, I'm thinking of doing that. Whereas UNLV is about 250 on the money line. And they had that impressive win over Houston, goes into Oklahoma the next week and almost upsets Oklahoma. So just how good is this UNLV team? Well, I guess we're going to find out, but it's always tough to go against Lance Leipold at home. And that's uh, part of the reason why I probably stay away from this one. But I, I'm even though I like and, and wagered a lot of money on Kansas State over the years with Chris Kleiman uh, and both Leipold, um, if I'm going to pick one of the two, I'd probably go with Arizona. Well, you know, these two fit uh, what I call, uh, I call them the Wizard of Oz, uh, or, or Wizard of Odds, O-D-D-S, two-team parlay in both Kansas teams when they're both at home. And the reason being, you mentioned Leipold at home, 31-11-1 against the spread with Kansas at home. Take a look at uh, Chris Kleiman the other side of the way. He's 20-9 and nine against the spread at home with Kansas state that's 51 and 20 combined. When these two coaches are both at home, yeah. they're both at home here on the same day, a Friday, nonetheless. Uh, I don't want any piece of the visiting teams here. So I can only look at the home teams. And it's really not what I do is lay favorites, you know, touchdown favorites. It's not my cup of tea, but I'll use those numbers, the climbing and the light pole numbers to keep me out of the dogs. Uh, which one do, would you feel more, uh, confident with UNLV with the upset or Arizona? I would say more confident with the upset, probably Arizona. Uh, UNLV, I think, is about to be exposed here. They're getting very, yeah. very popular uh, since Barry Odom's taken over here. They're drawing a lot of money every week, and that tells you that there's a lot of support for this football program. I don't know if that support comes out of Vegas, if it's the Vegas Sharps, or if it's not, but they're getting very, very popular is UNLV, and uh, I think there's a little, hence, a little more value in fading them as opposed to fading Arizona. Okay, uh, it's a good time for me to pop up some of the trends here. I'll pop them up now and then. Uh, you can, of course, freeze the frame if you want, uh, anytime uh, you'd like. Now, let's go to uh, the games that we want to talk about uh, this week on Saturday, and we're going to start with one of my three double-digit upsets, um, and, and and I'll be honest, I mean, this week I didn't really have one of those double-digit upsets where I was just, oh, I'm all over this. I, I really like this one. So I'm taking three teams that I think are qual quality enough programs, good football teams, but they're really stepping up in class, all three of these teams, and that's why I'm a little bit hesitant, but you know what? I think they're, they're – I'm just going to go with them. One of them is Wisconsin. And, 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 I, and, and I still don't know what to make out of Alabama yet. We saw what happened last year. They were able to turn their season around at kind of after that South Florida uh, game last year. Surprisingly, it went deep into the game again with South Florida last week. That was a big surprise. So I'm still not sure what to make of Alabama, except we, we, we give them credit. We give the coach credit. We, this is a quality team. If, if, but in this spot, uh, I don't mind going and saying, well, first road game, Wisconsin, everybody's kind of forgetting about them, They've, but they've won their first two. But like Arizona, they didn't look pretty doing it. Um, and I think a lot of people might be expecting that Wisconsin now is, is they're in big trouble. They're playing an SEC team. They're going to get exposed. They haven't looked good. I, I don't know. I, I'm going to give Luke Fickle a shot because I know things didn't go his way last year, uh, but I'm going to give him one shot, and that's going to be in this game because they've only been a home dog twice in the last 10 years. They covered both times, but it was against Ohio State. That's it. Uh, so they're not used to being in this spot because they're a very good program, especially at home. But then again, it's how rare is it for Wisconsin to get Alabama to come uh, to, uh, uh, to Camp Randall? So I'll roll the dice uh, on, uh, on Wisconsin uh, because they're a big 525 money line. Uh, dog. I agree with it, Greg. I like Wisconsin in this football game as well. And you mentioned how rare is it for Wisconsin to be taking points like this? Well, I'll tell you how rare it is. This is only the third time since 1928 that Alabama has played on a Big Ten field. They don't journey out too often. And when they do, it's usually against the cupcakes, not the Big Ten teams of the football world. That's what they're going to do here. 1928 three times uh, uh, that's a long long time between drinks of water for Alabama I think they're going to find the atmosphere here to be not all that uh favoring for Alabama in this football contest 
you'll find oftentimes these undefeated teams, Greg, they get off to these nice starts, especially against these pancakes. Then suddenly they find themselves in a football game. And now the question is, how will they react now that they're in a football game rather than just going through the motions? There'll be no going through the motions uh, in this football game uh, when they're playing the Badgers here on Saturday. I like Alabama plus the points. And if an upset occurred here, Greg, I won't be surprised. Yeah, I think if it's going to happen, it's going to happen on, on the defensive side. So I, I do not believe if Wisconsin wins this game, it's going to be 34-31. I'd be surprised. I think if they win this game, it's going to be a slugfest. It's going to be a, a 19-17 type of game. Yes, yes, I will. Right. Because I that's where Wisconsin – because the, the offense still just hasn't looked as good as we know it's capable – or at least we think it's capable. Of course, they don't have that star running back. Malusi's okay, but he's not Braylon Allen. He's not Jonathan Taylor. And the offensive passing game with Van Dyke, with, with Longo coming in last year, it just hasn't clicked yet. So, But we'll see. Again, it's up to the defense, and we'll see if Luke Fickle has something uh, in the tank there as a home dog. All right. Uh, also, we'll stick in the SEC just quickly. Georgia, Kentucky, they're a heavy favorite. What do you think about this matchup? Because – um, Georgia, when they're in this spot, uh, th this is actually not, this hasn't been historically good for them. In other words, they're coming off a game in which they've scored more than 45 points. And over the last three years, when they play games after one of those types of 45 or more performances, they're only one and eight against the spread the last three years. Meanwhile, Kentucky six and one against the spread as an, as an, uh, 11 point or more, uh, dog. Uh, in a revenge situation. Of course, it got blown out last year at Georgia when the last couple of meetings have been pretty tough. I do like Mark Stoops in this football game here. I know I have this uh, this habit. People say it's a bad habit of always trying to knock down the number one team in college football each and every week. Well, I'm not going to be on the number one team each and every week. I can assure you that. So when I find an opportunity with a good team and a reason to play that brings something to the table, I'm going to make a case for them. That's the case here for Kentucky in this football game. You've got Mark Stoops uh, in a role that he really, really uh, relishes, and that's as a home underdog and as a double-digit dog. You get the combination of the two. Georgia here looking perfect right now. I, I think everybody has them in the championship playoff game right now at, yeah. at, this, at this stage of the football season. But, you know, they, it's because they won 41 regular season games in a row, so people get tired of watching them win all the time. But this is a really, really tricky spot here at Kentucky here. You mentioned uh, how he does not perform well after high-scoring outbursts at Georgia. Kirby Smart does not. You put all that stuff together here, I think this football game will come down to who scores last. And if it's Georgia, they're still the number one team. If it's not, oh. if it's not, then we talk about another huge upset on Saturday's card. Wow. You're you really behind Kentucky here. Yes, I, I, I am. I, I yes. was surprised by that. Good. All right. Interesting. Like I said, I mean, if you take a look at it, the last, uh, the, before last year, the, the preceding couple of matchups had been pretty close. Okay. Uh, next one, also SEC matchup, or at least one SEC team. This one at home, Missouri, big favorite, 16 and a half against Boston College. Boston College came up with the big upset against Florida State that we talked about, of course, two weeks ago as uh, as a uh, outright upset on your behalf against FSU as a 19 point dog. I don't, I can't see Boston College winning again. That would be like, well, wait a second, what are they? Uh, <laughs> Final Four competitive? Uh, competitor? There you go. There you go. <laughs> I don't see that happening, but I like the points. It's a lot of points. It's it, 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 and, and I'm not saying I don't think it should be. I, I probably had Missouri more as a 14 but it's up to close to 17 and BC is actually 5011 ATS less six versus SEC teams. So I'm going to go ahead and take the points here. Cause again, Bill O'Brien's worth it. He's already proven it. Castellano is an excellent quarterback. We've talked about him, uh, not a pro quarterback. He's a really good college quarterback. Uh, and, uh, yeah. So, uh, cook has been a little bit, uh, underwhelming so far, uh, this season, but, uh, this is a game that I could see BC hanging around. I'm 100% in agreement with you again here, Greg. Uh, this is a Boston College football team, and you hit it right on the head. Bill O'Brien, that, that's a nice, nice edge at the at the coaching position. I know Elijah Drinkwitz has done a nice job with this football team, but Bill yeah. O'Brien, you know, who would you rather be your head coach, Bill O'Brien or Elijah Drinkwitz? Uh, there's no doubt in my mind who I would rather have. In Boston College, you've also got a team that's loaded with experience, 17 starters back from last year's football team. They proved it in that upset against Florida State. And it's my feeling that sooner or later, 
Missouri is going to be exposed as a fraud. Uh, they they surprised everybody last year, and they caught some fire at the end. They've opened up pretty good here this year, but I think they're going to be exposed. And if it happens here this weekend, I'm not going to be surprised again. Wow. Okay. Oh, sh- surprising me again. Look at this. Boston <laughs> College and Kentucky. All right. Uh, let's now talk about the next game. We're going to go outside the SEC and talk uh, Big Ten football, or at least a little Big Ten football. We've got these matchups, these, these Pac-12 early season matchups, and I know they're not Pac-12 anymore, but it's Oregon at Oregon State and Washington State at Washington. What is this, November? Uh, so it's kind of fun to get these rivalry matchups this early in the season. Uh, but let's start with that Oregon game because, wow, I mean, Oregon last week. Now, we, we know how good Boise State has been, thanks to Genty. And Genty has been fantastic. And we've talked him up, and you saw for yourself. Matter of fact, uh, last week we, we put him in our Heisman odds watch, and he was 100 to 1. He's now 22 to 1. Wow. So hopefully, if you watched the show last week, you grabbed him at 100 to 1 because you lost a lot of value there after last week's awesome performance and almost upsetting uh, Oregon on their home turf. But here's the thing is that Oregon – you know, even though they won the game and it was a better team, it's still, this is not the Oregon team we were expecting. We were expecting a couple of blowouts to start the season. I mean, even though Boise State's quality team, we still expect, they were 20 point favorite. We expected them to win 21 points. I mean, and they barely won the game. And now this is the road opener. Oregon State, of course, the big rival. And let's not forget, here's the, here's the thing. We don't, it's, this is tough because Oregon State, Jonathan Smith's gone. But we, all, we know when Jonathan Smith was there, this was a very tough team at home. 13 and two against the spread the last three years at home. That is just awesome. So I'm going to take an Oregon state and the 17. And this is just like Wisconsin going to be my, one of my double digit upset picks of the week. Hey, Greg, I'm going to have to order up a diploma for you from the Mark Lawrence double digit live dog school. Oh no. Of handicapping. Yes. <laughs> and I'm hundred percent with you on this game here as well. This has to stop. So one of these one of these games it'll stop. We, we, we can't keep agreeing. Each, yeah, each yeah because we'll find a hole in the dog or, yeah. or something that we don't want to step in front of. But uh, there's a common denominator, a thread in these two games here, and I'm going to tell you about it in just a bit here. But uh, there's also a great author out there. Uh, he's a freelance author. He's an Oregon-based writer. His name is John Canzano, and he publishes something called The Ball Face Truth. And he's a terrific writer, writer and he keeps a, a hand on a pulse on the Oregon football teams like no other, nobody else in, that I know of does. I subscribe to his, his writings, I should say. And in one short sentence, he calls Oregon a hot mess. And the reason he calls them a hot mess is because you're never going to be surprised if they're going to deliver a clunker or they're going to blow somebody out. They're capable of playing awful and incredible week to week to week. Now, what have we got here? We've got Oregon just about ready to kick off their debut in the Big Ten Conference, and Oregon State looking for a partner in the Pac-2. This is the Civil War we're talking about, and all of a right. sudden, all of a sudden, there's secession here. Uh, Oregon's gone somewhere else, and Oregon State's left here to stay at home and mind the children. I think this is a huge game for Oregon State in a statement-making game in a football contest like this. Oregon has not played consistent football thus far this football season, and if they don't bring their A game here, they're going to get taken out in this contest as well. I went so far in our newsletter to call Oregon State our upset game of the week. Wow. Holy moly. <laughs> this is as much as we've uh, been uh, simpatico on yes. these games. So it's going to change. You'll see. It'll change real quick. Uh, okay. but I like it. Makes me feel good about that. Uh, all right. So there, uh, and the other one again is Washington and Washington state. So you got the apple cup in September. Oh, by the way, let's keep in mind about this too. The home team in the civil war has won five straight. So yes. nice. that, uh, people may not, may not realize that, you know, so Oregon state's done their part. They're at home in the series. They've won it. Um, Meanwhile, you get the Apple Cup. By the way, this will be at Lumen Field. So this is where Seattle plays, the Seahawks in the NFL. And Washington's a five-point favorite. And I have been impressed with how Washington State started their season. They had a nice win last week uh, against Texas Tech. So that was nice because they're in that same situation as Oregon State, as you just mentioned. Um, 
But if you look at it here, Washington has really dominated the series. They've won 12 out of 14. They've covered 10 out of 14. And also, uh, one of the trends I have here is, is that they've covered nine straight as a favorite of 17 or less, wow. taking on an opponent with a revenge situation or back-to-back straight-up wins. And where did I get these trends? Where did you, All those trends are just flashed on the board. Where did I get them? I got them right here. The Playbook yeah. Magazine. So you can check it out. You can order this. I have a link in the description of the video. Uh, can't can't handicap games without it. If for some reason uh, you want more than this, or uh, you want to check out something that's more in a week to week deal, then check out the newsletter, uh, the week to week newsletter that will also have a link in the description from Playbook uh, Sports. So yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and take Washington, uh, especially because the line is pretty small at five. Greg, give me that diploma back, if you would, please. Oh, here we go, finally. <laughs> uh, I'm going to, again, gonna go with the the rivalry. Dog. The rivalry dog. Okay, that's the key, a rivalry, Apple Cup rivalry, uh, soon to be over as they head to the Big Ten. Uh, and you got something unique in this football game. This is the first time you got to go back to 1936 to find the last time these two teams were both undefeated when they met in the Apple Cup. Well, that's because it's September. That's awesome. Yes. That's, yes. And that's the reason is because they usually play at the end of the season. Okay. Yeah. But now here it is the front end of the season here. But again, I'm, I'm going to allude to the fact that where's Washington going next week? They got Northwestern, the big 10 opener, Washington state looking for a dance partner. Again, uh, I don't say that Washington state looks at Oregon like they bailed on them. No, because it wasn't Washington's entire doing, but Washington state was left home and not invited to the party. And I think they're going to also come as hard as they can in this football game. I like them plus the points. Okay. Memphis and Florida State. And Florida State, uh, they had that uh, awful start to the season. They're 0-2. And Mike Norville, the former Memphis head coach, will take on his former team uh, early on Saturday. It's the road opener for the Tigers, who have looked awfully impressive the first couple of weeks. We've talked about them as one of the teams to beat. Matter of fact, we both have him in the championship game this year. Seth Hennigan, who's been there forever, uh, is still there, quarterback. Mario Anderson Jr. is off to a really good start. The South Carolina transfer running back. So now they've got some quarterback play, some running back play. And Florida State, wow. I mean, uh, I, I, can you imagine them going 0-3? Well, it's going to be tough. I don't like Ryan Silverfield, though, in this spot. He's 3-9 and against the spread as a road dog. Uh, since he's been taking over this franchise. But let's keep in mind this. Uh, things weren't all great before that. They're 3-13 and 13 in their last 16 as a road dog. So this has never been a good spot or hasn't been for a long time for Memphis. It's only seven. Uh, so, But look, I can't take Florida State. I'll say that right now. There's no way I'm touching Florida State the way they've been playing. So this is a tough one for me. If I was going to take the game, I might take Memphis, but I'll probably just stay away. Well, you know – I'm going to let the game go too because of value. Okay. The value has been totally stripped out because of the fact that the Florida state start and Memphis is undefeated here right now. So the combination of the two, you lost three to six points in the point spread. I'm not going to chase that. Uh, but I will say this, that uh, we drew a parallel uh, to F Florida state uh, thus far this football season here. Memphis has been dominated by the ACC. They played the ACC 15 times. They've won one game. Uh, so they get sort of like stepping out of their realm, their uh, comfort zone, if yep. you will, uh, taking on an opponent like this who's in a surly, nasty mood. There's no question about it here. But also, uh, it's also like for Memphis, it's like we said in our newsletter, it's like the end of a Stephen King novel. There's never a happy ending. And that will probably be the case for Memphis in a football game like this because Florida State is awfully hungry. Now, can they do anything about it? I'm not going to pay the price to find out because I think this football team is questioning themselves right now. And goodness, God forbid, if Memphis pulls the rug on this, <laughs> yeah. this game here, look out, Katie, bar the door. College football playoff, here they come. Yeah, uh, that's the thing, is that it, this is a great opportunity for Memphis and Silverfield to prove whether or not they're capable of taking the next step. Can Ryan Silverfield be on the same – you know, can he be considered like Willie Fritz, one of these guys? I don't think so. I'm sure you don't think so. No. But if he wants to prove that, well, go out and this is your opportunity. Do it. This is your shot. So we'll see if he can do it. I doubt it. I think you doubt it as well. But 
uh, hey, you know what? If, if it happens, congratulations. And then we'll take him a lot more seriously, even though we already like him as AAC champs. But whether or not we like him, anything more than that, uh, that'll come after the game at 12 o'clock on Saturday. Hey, right. Greg, here's one quick point before you move on here. Sure. Florida State, okay, remember last year they opened up 13-0. and They were the darlings of the college football world. Begging to be the number one team in the country, for sure, everybody thought in the college football playoff. But since they were 13-0 and last year, they've gone 0-3 straight up <laughs> and against the spread. They've been outscored 115-37. to So whatever happened at that – after party when they when the, won their 13th game last year has turned to total disaster for this program here. You cannot play them as a favorite until they turn it around themselves. Yep. And, and really what it is is they've lost all that talent because yep. they didn't get the talent in the bowl game, they didn't, and the talent's gone in the offseason, including their quarterback, and uh, that's what it is. It's a talent game. Okay, uh, one more. I just want to ask you about the Central Florida TCU matchup because actually uh, K.J. Jefferson is going to be my only Heisman uh, add on, uh, this week, he's 80 to one. And I, I don't, of course, think he's going to win it, but it's not about what it's not about that. When it, when, when you put these, uh, picks in, in, in futures, it's about, well, but do you think there's a shot? And, and sure. He's a talented kid. He came from the sec. I love the way he played. Uh, last year wasn't all that great. He gets a, a fresh start with such a Florida and Gus Malzahn. And, and 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 now this is the big game to start the season for Central Florida to prove whether or not they're they have improved from last year to this year in the second year in the Big Twelve. So I figured, you know what, if he pulls it out and has a big game, uh, then that number is going to drop maybe in half. So that's why I went that route with KJ at eighty to one. Um, but aren't you surprised a little bit? I I picked this line as about three and a half when the week began. Now it was one and a half. I don't know if I don't know if it started where it started, but I know it was one and a half on Monday. Uh, now it's two Central Florida. I, I'm a little bit surprised by that. Well, I'm not. Uh, only given the sense that you hit it right in the head with KJ Jefferson. Uh, he's the kind of a player that you add on your Heisman list at eighty to one because. One, he has ability, but two, he's playing on a team that can really help him out. Oh yeah. This, this, this football team has been known to smash anybody that is smashable and beatable. And they do that. All that does is elevate KJ Jefferson in the Heisman trophy race. So he's on the ideal team uh, as far as a long shot Heisman play goes in, in a situation like this. Uh, and I, because of that, that's a reason, a number one reason here. Also, I think that this line got pushed to central Florida the way it has. I wouldn't lay it because I wouldn't chase it, but I certainly don't want the other side of this game. All right. And then uh, also I uh, just want, and, and I'll get into it. Uh, let's see if do we have, no, actually I might as well just do it right now. The three teams, uh, there's actually only two teams that have added onto my uh, futures championship futures this week. And that is uh 22 to one Tennessee and 200 to one. I cannot believe the two, they're still 200 to one. And that's Iowa state uh, shocked that after what they did on Saturday, that they get no respect at all. So uh, easily went after them. You know, I, I lose value on Tennessee, but I think it was important. I, I wanted to see, how, even if they beat Nancy State, I'm not sure where I would have been on it, but I was so impressed with how they beat NC State. I mean, that might have been the most impressive performance I've seen from Tennessee since Josh Heupel's been there. They're playing some really good football. There's no doubt about it. And I can understand you're being uh, lured and drawn into Tennessee because I think they're playing a lot better than people anticipated this year. Uh, is there value here for the, where they, they're playing right now? Yeah, it's arguable, but yeah. I know for certain there's value on Iowa state. There's no question about that. They did to Iowa, what Iowa does to other football teams. They hung around, hung around, hung around and won the football game in the end. So what are they now? They're undefeated. They've got all this, this returning wealth of talent uh, coming back for this football program. And they're extremely well coached. I think it's a heck of a play Iowa state. And I wouldn't be surprised if they're playing in, the Big 12 championship game, as you and I both predicted earlier on in the yep. in this season. Yes. Yeah. Very, very impressive. Come from behind win. And and they had to have those two goal line stops early in the game. Yep. To, 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 so I had to settle for field goals twice. And if they don't get both of those stops, probably don't win. You know, they might have with one of them, but still, it made it a lot easier. They just had to kick the field goal. And that's because they had those two stops. So, yeah, very impressive comeback by Iowa State. All right, and, Dan, and Dan Campbell would tell you that that's the mistake Iowa made going for those field goals. He does not go for field goals <laughs> in situations like that, as we well know. <laughs> yes. 
Uh, all right. Now, uh, under the radar games this week, I've got four of them. And I'm not going to consider Tulane, Oklahoma, a, a major under the radar because it is Oklahoma. But it's Tulane. And, and I still think there's a, a majority of people in this country that really just don't even respect Tulane, as they should. Uh, especially after the performance from that young quarterback, Mensa. Boy, it looks like they've got another good one. That's that's why I thought Tulane was going to maybe be having a little bit of a of a hangover this year. But first of all, we know they have a really good coach to take over for Fritz and Summerall, and and then throw in the fact they've got a nice young quarterback. They almost it looked like they had Kansas State on the ropes, but then Kansas State battled back for the win late. So you have to give Tulane a lot of credit. I don't know what to make of Oklahoma. I mean, Venable seems like a nice coach, but. Last year and then this year, he has these games where it's like, well, what are you doing? Why are you only beating Houston by a couple of points and you're struggling to beat Houston? Tulane's better than Houston. So, and Oklahoma next week is taken on Tennessee. That is a huge potential look ahead game. So, I think Tulane is, by the way, I mentioned this because not only as they're one of the look away games, I mean, they're under the radar games, but Tulane is my final of three, a double digit dog upset at plus 40. So I'm going to go ahead and roll the dice with Tulane along with Wisconsin and Oregon state. So I just need to get one out of the three of them. And if I do I'm ahead of the game, uh, the other under the radar games, I want to, I want, I want you to tell me which one you'd prefer to see is Indiana at UCLA, West Virginia in the backyard brawl at Pitt, and Colorado at Colorado state. We know what a really exciting game that was last year. Uh, so is it, is it easy to say Tulane and Oklahoma? And if it is, then what about the other three, which would you rather see, uh, as far as those three? Well, if it's not Tulane, Oklahoma, and is it, it correct me if I'm wrong, is it John Summerall, the new head coach at Tulane? Yes. Yeah. He's, 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 from, he's from Troy. Yep. Yeah. He's, he's brilliant. Okay. And he's yep. going to go a long, long way with that football program. He may prove exactly why they hired him in this Oklahoma game. I think there's a huge coaching mismatch there. Brent Venables is the classic case of a Peter principal, a defensive coordinator hired to be a head coach who does not get the most out of his offense. That's case in point, Brent Venables. Of these games, uh, the ones that I would have to watch, I, I would certainly toss UCLA out of, of the mix, Indiana. And I would also toss Colorado and Colorado State out of the mix because I'm not a big Deion Sanders fan at all. Uh, so you don't even you don't want to see him for three hours. You just don't no, I don't. Something you're looking yeah, for. Okay. If I see him on a highlight film, that's enough. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it would be Tulane at Oklahoma or West Virginia Pitt, and that you know that brawl between West Virginia yeah. Pitt is all, always a good one. And uh, you know I'm a little bit surprised here that West Virginia is coming in the favorite in the football game, but nonetheless it would be either Tulane, Oklahoma, or West Virginia Pitt. And then just quickly, because uh, I flashed on the best bet options I have this week, uh, I would want to uh, talk about a couple of them with you. I talked about this with Andy on the Predict the Lines uh, video that yep. we did a couple of days ago. One of them th that we have a, a segment or, or a, a section where, I, where we say, well, which one were you completely off on? And one of them that I was completely off on was Eastern Michigan and Jacksonville State. I actually thought they were going to be a 14-point favorite, and it was two. And I, I, I just don't understand why. I'm sorry. I just don't. I mean, Jacksonville State has done nothing this year. They've looked nothing like the team they were last year. Eastern Michigan has looked better than they looked last year. Uh, we know Chris Creighton is is, is is one of these better dog roll coaches. I get that, but that's not the, that's not the, the that's not the point. The point is, no pun intended, is what the, what is the point spread or what, what yes. do you think it should be? And I, I I think it should have been uh, close to 14. I think Andy said 7 to 10. So were you quite surprised that it's only two? I'm a little bit surprised. I really am. Uh, you know, you're talking about a Jacksonville State football team that entered the, with the big boys last year and won nine games. I mean, I thought that was probably the uh, – it, it deserved some sort of an award for a team coming into the FBS like that. So, sort of James Madison like what they did last year, but they're certainly not James Madison like this year. Uh, so I don't know if they, you know, they just had too much celebration in the off season or whatnot, however it goes. But and you know, I'm a big, huge Chris Creighton fan here as well. So uh, my heart will be out for Chris Creighton, and I'll probably have a bob or two on him as well. All right, and also uh, I really how uh, down to your neck of the country with FIU just blasting Central Michigan last week. That was very impressive. So you know what? They've been dominated by FAU, their rivals, uh, for the last uh, six year, six meetings. They've lost by a combined four, average 47 to 15 
in the points, 286 to 92 total. So they've been dominating this series, but I just got to believe that Mike McIntyre's got this team going where he wants it. Uh, Keone Jenkins, we talked about the young quarterback last year. He's coming into his own in year two. Tom Herman is a little bit behind McIntyre. So I think McIntyre could use it to his advantage. There's a ton of trends that point to FIU in this matchup as well. And I just think this is one of those, you know, not double, not triple, not quadruple, but six-time revenge situations that FIU is going to take out on on FAU. Uh, That's uh, something that I – but again, it's it's FIU and FAU, so don't be be, uh, uh, investing your mortgage on that one. Um, and also, uh, I want to keep an eye on the North Texas game because we, we, you know, this is a program uh, that I think is headed in the right direction. I like their quarterback. They get that kid Morris, the TCU transfer. Been very impressed with him. I know he threw some interceptions last week, but I, I think they might be a surprise in their game against Texas Tech. And I really like what Tony Elliott's starting to do with Virginia. They're a slight dog against Maryland. They had a great win last week against Wake Forest, and uh, I, I think that this is one of those games that I can see them winning as they slowly start to turn the, the program around. I agree. I think Virginia's on the come right now. Tony Elliott, I think, is going to get that program back. Uh, and as far as the FIU-FAU series goes, uh, a friend of mine, he calls that uh, fit and flat, uh, like the uh, abbreviations for the two schools, FIT and FLAT, fit and flat. Uh, and I mentioned one time a long time ago when I was just new in this business, and I said to somebody, a real wise, sharp, old-time handicapper, and I says, well, what, what about the revenge in this football game? Don't you think that matters? And he says to me, son, he says, there's no revenge in this football game. It's called domination, okay? When one <laughs> team dominates another, the opponent doesn't look at it like revenge. They look yeah. at it like they got to they gotta wipe some egg off their face eventually. Um, but I think F- FIU is capable of doing that here this particular year. I'm a big Mike McIntyre fan as well. Yep. And his hire, I think, was really, really a good hire. And I like them against flat or F Florida Atlantic this week. Yeah, they haven't had that program look good since Cristobal left. So maybe this is an opportunity for them to kind of get back in the right direction. All right. Now let's talk some NFL as we move away from the college uh, game. And NFL, let's just uh, quickly, uh, because we should be able to get this up on the uh, channel uh, before the game tonight. Uh, and that is the Buffalo uh, Miami game. Uh, and uh, Miami is a two and a half point favorite. And I, and I talk about this a lot. And here's another example. And, 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 and I talk, every time I talk about this, we talk, and, and this is something we, we, we went over with, with Washington last year against uh, Oregon is that anytime one team dominates another in the series and the team that has been dominated lately is the favorite I always go to the team that is the, the the dominator and it's like 90% it works. And we saw that last year. Nobody thought Oregon was going to, when Washington was going to beat Oregon uh, last year in that rematch, the line was incredibly high, even though Washington had won the game. And what did Washington do from start to finish? They just blew out Oregon. No problem. Uh, this is not to that extreme, but let's just keep in mind, Buffalo's won four straight, straight up against Miami including the 2022 playoff game, Miami also, and I know you being down there, if they don't, if Travis Etienne does not fumble, and that was a great play, by the way, by Holland. Great play. Terrific play. That's why he's yeah. one of the better safeties in the game. Can't take that away from Miami. They went out and got it. But that fumble doesn't happen. The game is over. And Jacksonville wins, probably running away. Give Miami a lot of credit. Give Holland credit. But it also, I say, may say something in a negative against Jacksonville where they are right now with their psyche. But Miami just didn't look; they just didn't look crisp. They didn't look, now. Maybe what they did at the end of the game will springboard it this week. It's a short week, but I don't know. I'm still willing to go ahead and say, like I said, they're two and a half point underdog. They beat Miami four straight times, so I'm going to go ahead and take uh, Buffalo in this spot. Well, if you take a look at the way this game sets up, Greg, uh, neither team looked sharp last week. Buffalo fell behind early in the game against Arizona and uh, barely uh, wins the game. I don't even believe they covered the spread, but wins the game. And Miami, uh, the same thing. Uh, They just hung around, hung around, hung around, got a break, and won the game. I think personally that when you have two division teams that are playing football games on a Thursday against each other, the game before, they're not going to show anything, anything on film to their opponent at all. 
they were both thrilled at what happened. They got in, they got out with wins, and they didn't have to expose anything. So I think we're going to see a much better effort from both of these football teams in this game here tonight. Uh, and Buffalo sort of comes close to this, this one pet theory that I have. You mentioned it about a team dominates another team, and now they're the underdog. I call it Dia Dia, dominating dogs in action, doing it again. Okay. And you, you love those guys when, you know, all you've done is ever forever beat the snot out of somebody. And now suddenly you're the underdog. And it's like, yeah. what happened here? You know, what? Ha I don't know if Buffalo has quite got the snot out of Miami, but they've, they've kind of held an upper hand for sure. Uh, but still, I'm not going to touch the game because I believe Miami is sitting on what they feel like they got a gift. They won a football game that arguably they should not have. And sometimes they're playing with house money the next game in a game like that. And you're talking about putting them in a win situation, a spread less than three here. Very small lane to Miami in this game. All right. Now let's talk about the games on Sunday. And let's start with that New Orleans-Dallas game because, uh, wow, I mean, what an awful uh, opening game for Canales, the new head coach for Carolina by that program. But do they need a, they need a win uh, fast. Uh uh, anyway, for New Orleans, I don't think anybody expected them to blow out Carolina the way they did. Um, and this is important because they've covered the Saints 11 straight on the road after they score 40 or more when they take on an opponent coming off a straight-up win like the Cowboys, of course, did over Cleveland. And by the way, the Cowboys have covered 16 of 25 as a home favorite since 2021. Uh, so I, I don't know. I, I just Here's the deal. I just can't. It's always hard for me to go and take uh, the Saints and Allen, Dennis Allen. I just, I mean, um, uh, not Dennis Allen. He hasn't been in a head coach for about 20 years. Uh, but the defensive coordinator, uh, uh, what is his name? For which defensive coordinator? I mean, the head coach, the Saints. What is his name? It's Allen. Allen, yes. It's uh, his first name. What is his name? It's not the same as, as the Arizona, as the former Arizona Minnesota coach, is it? Uh, uh, yes, it is. Okay, it is Dennis okay. Allen. Okay, there you Isn't go. Isn't that the name of uh, that uh, former Arizona Minnesota coach? Yeah, he was a black coach. Yes. Yeah, that right. guy. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah, he was infamous for the what is that thing he was in? He has that uh, that I forget what it was. He, he has that infamous soundbite. Uh, I don't remember what it is, but anyway. So the second Dennis Allen, the one who's coaching out for the Saints, I just can't get behind him. So that's probably why I'll just stay away from it. Well, there's a thing here I'd be a little weary of if you're going to ride the Dallas Cowboy train again this week, and it's this. Uh, Cleveland stood no chance in their football game last week. They were completely depleted. Uh, Dallas whooped on them from the beginning, from the get-go to the end. But if you look at the stats in the end of the football game, it, they only beat them by 60 yards. They didn't, they didn't gain 400 yards to Dallas in the contest here. A lot of it was gifts, and they turned them into points. Now suddenly you win a big football game like that, and you're priced accordingly. You bring in New Orleans here, as you mentioned, off that big, huge win like that. Uh, that's a little bit of a confidence builder, I think, in their in their part because they are a terrific dog, if you will. Uh, Eleven and one to the spread as a road dog of four or more. That's a big, big number here in a football game like this. I think Dallas is the one who lets down in this football game. All right, San Francisco, Minnesota. These two teams played last year, and Minnesota upset San Francisco. And that had happened the week after the Cleveland game, the week after the uh, – they had those injuries. They had that part of the season, the Niners last year, where they didn't have three key members of their team. It was Trent Williams, Christian McCaffrey, and I believe Debo. And they weren't around, and they, they lost a couple of games. This was one of them. But Minnesota came off a very impressive win against the Giants. They're a two to one on the money line uh, dog here. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. This is actually one where I'm. I, I, I just wouldn't take San Francisco here. Uh, but would I take Minnesota? Uh, I would consider them. They're one of the teams that I have in my consideration for a uh, an upset this week. I have three of those. Minnesota's one of them at plus one ninety. I'm not saying I'm taking them, but they're in consideration. Well, if you like trends, the home team in the series has won the money six times in a row, oh. uh, which supports Minnesota in a football game like this. Uh, people want to poo-poo Sam Darnold, but the fact of the matter is he got the job done last week, and uh, now he's coming back here against San Francisco, who's off that big win last week. Uh, they didn't even break a sweat in the football game against the Jets. Uh, so maybe it's a little bit overconfidence here by San Francisco in a contest like this. Bottom line to me, 
San Francisco is one of these dreaded Super Bowl losers. And when they, these teams go out as road favorites in non-division football games, they seldom come back with a win. And that's a very dangerous spot, I think, for San Francisco to be in this week. I think Minnesota has a lot of confidence right now. Arnold proved, or Darnold proved that he, he's capable of stepping up. I think they're going to take Frisco right down to the wire this week. And by the way, this is part of your awesome angle yes. uh, in the newsletter. Uh, and the next game is in your incredible stat in the newsletter. And that is Tampa Bay and Detroit. And uh, look, uh, I know the incredible stat doesn't work for me this week in, in, in this spot. But, you know, I mean, if, if Tampa Bay, they, they just keep uh, proving everybody wrong. I know it's only one week, uh, but uh, they had that win, great season last year, winning the division. And here they are. See, I, the thing with this one is, is I'm really surprised at the odds. Uh, I just don't think they're getting any respect. Uh, the Rams were about a four and a half point dog. I thought the Bucks were going to be a four and a half point dog, but it's seven and a half now. the The money line is shot up to three to one, which again is why Tampa Bay is one of my top uh, uh, upset uh, options this week because they're a quality team at three to one on the money line, and they also were seven and two as a road dog last year. Or so, um, but Dan Campbell is great in this spot. Uh, we know that historically. Uh, so uh, I, I don't know if Tampa Bay could pull off the upset. But I just, I don't know. I just feel like Tampa Bay is being a little bit disrespected with the odds. Well, they are, Greg. Uh, there's a football team that, uh, I, what is it, three years in a row they were in the playoffs. Uh, they got out to a great start again this year. Baker Mayfield has completely turned this football team 180 degrees around. But that stat you talked about also sits in the back of my mind, and it's simply that Baker Mayfield does not fare well against good football teams. Yeah. You know, I mean, two and – 12 straight up, 1-13 and 13 to the spread against 800 or better opponents. It more or less says that uh, he has a tough time. He is, gets intimidated by good football teams. And I'll go so far as to have to say, yes, Detroit is a good football team. Okay, the next game let's talk about uh, on Sunday is actually a couple of them. you got the the, 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 uh, uh, the Ohio teams, Cleveland at Jacksonville, Cincinnati at Kansas City. And look, we, we, we said this was a possibility with Cleveland. We, we talked about this uh, on the season preview. As much as we liked Cleveland, there was a lot of issues in the preseason and in training camp with the offensive line. They hadn't played together at all. There were some injuries, some guys banged up, and then it was just going to throw them all out there, especially the fact that, that their, their guru, offensive line coach, was gone. and going to throw them out there and hope for the best. Well. It was a disaster, and they got destroyed at the line of scrimmage. And, of course, there was no Nick Chubb. So this is going to be a good football team once they get into a rhythm, once they get Chubb back. Um, but this is going to be an interesting game because you got a Jacksonville team, as I said just a few minutes ago, that just let the game get out of – I mean, they had the Dolphins. They, they, were, they, were, they were like this. They had them on their throats, and then they just completely let them off the hook. And as soon as the – look, it's like Trevor Etienne fumbled and the Dolphins scored three touchdowns in, 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 on a fumble. That's how it, like, appeared. It's like they completely went in the tank. Like, uh-oh, something bad's going to happen. And that's a team with a very fragile, uh, fragile mindset right now. Very fragile. The way they closed out the football season last year, moving into this year, it's not been good for Jacksonville, to say the least. Uh, the Browns, as you mentioned, have their problems, uh, physical ailments, uh, this offensive line was a strength for this football team. Now, all of a sudden, uh, it's gone completely the other way. Uh, but coming into this contest here, I think this is all about Kevin Stefanski and how good he is. He's won two-time Coach of the Year in the National Football League. And this is his role. When he gets beat as a favorite, upset, he's come 10 times it's happened, eight times he's come back and win the next football game, 5-0 and oh, as a dog in those particular games. So I'm going to stay with Cleveland here in this football contest here. Hopefully, someday, some way, somehow, we're going to see a Deshaun Watson signing. And <laughs> there will be good news for him rather than another lawsuit <laughs> that he's yeah, fending yeah. off. But, uh, you know, my goodness, if, if he can start winning football games on the field. It will all uh, go away. It, yeah. it will all go away. Exactly right. That's the sad truth of the matter. Yes. Uh, by the way, the Bengals, uh, this is actually a good spot for them. They're 13-4. and four. They're last 17 in, as a road dog. And Kansas City's just one and five after a Thursday night home game. Uh, the lines actually dropped a little bit to five and a half from six. 
The Bengals are still a real solid two to one money line play. And they're uh, one of the three that I have as far as my top upset options, along with Minnesota and Tampa Bay, that I'm going to decide uh, a little bit later on which way to go. Uh, and let's keep this in mind. We talked about it last week before the New England game. As easy as it looked, there was a red flag. And that was that under uh, Zach Taylor, the Bengals have gone 0-2 in four of the five years he's been head coach to start the, the season, the, uh, to start the season, the yeah. other time they were just one on one. So they've never started two and zero, and they might go and two again. Uh, but uh, the schedule says that they still, still should, they might, might be okay. But yeah, I don't know. I still think that this is a chance. First of all, they got to get T Higgins back. I mean, enough of this with this guy being injured all the time. They got to get him on the field. So We'll see. I'm not sure if I heard anything yet. I don't know if you did, whether or not he's oh, going to yeah. be able to play. Uh, but if he does, that's a big, big shot in the arm. If he doesn't, obviously it makes life tough. But I still think they're not a bad idea considering uh, the history. They play this team all the time. And, uh, and 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 now they're coming off of the expected to win role to the expected to lose role. And maybe that'll help them. Well, I know one thing that, uh, you know, if you're in this locker room for Cincinnati – and somebody's going to stand up and tell these teams, these guys, hey, guys, look, if we start the season 0-2, 11% of the teams in the National Football League that have started 0-2 have not made the playoffs. Do we want to be in amongst that group? I, we're a much, much better football team than this. They're going to come to this football game, forget the loss, and I know it was New England, and they laid an egg. Uh, the one thing that I saw coming to the game is uh, from a survivor standpoint, you know, the survivor pools where you got to pick the straight-up winner. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, Cincinnati was the overwhelming favorite last week. Yeah. And when they, <laughs> generally, they go down more often than they don't. And when they go down, the pool gets crushed. It gets crashed. And it happened last week to this football team. But Joe Burrow is at his best in this particular role. And his best is when he takes on a team that just won and covered the spread their previous game. He's 14-2 and two straight up and against the spread in this role uh, when taking on a team that's coming off a straight up and ATS win. 7-0 and oh straight up on the road in this particular role. I think Cincinnati – up ends Kansas City here. All right, there you go. So that is the uh, your advice as far as those three money line outright wins that I threw out there. So you've answered my question there. Uh, okay. By the way, yeah, the, it, Higgins. It looks like he ain't gonna play this week, so uh, they're gonna have to do it without him. All right. Uh, and then uh, finally, uh, just uh, the, the prime time games. You got Chicago and Houston, Atlanta and Philadelphia. And uh, just a note with these two prime time games for me is the fact that. Uh, first of all, uh, when you're taking a look at uh, the Chicago team and, and how they came back to beat Tennessee, had nothing to do with Caleb Williams because Caleb Williams did not look very good. No. So, uh, and the Bears are also nine and nineteen, and in the last twenty eight is a road dog. So, I think Houston is going to have uh, Caleb Williams for lunch, and I, I like Houston in that spot. And uh, Monday night, uh, the Eagles uh, also I think are a good play. They're sixteen and two on Monday night football off a straight up ATS win. And keep this in mind too. Raheem Morris, the head coach of the Falcons is only three and 12 against the spread as a head coach. When he takes on a team that is 500 or better. So uh, I'll take the Eagles and the six points. So I'm going to go with the two six point home favorites in prime time Sunday and Monday night. Well, to get to the Houston-Chicago game, uh, obviously you weren't impressed with those 93 passing yards that Caleb Williams <laughs> no, I was last not. week. Okay? No. Uh, neither was I. Yeah. And uh, you know, Houston got out by the skin of their teeth uh, from Indianapolis, got the win but not the they money. Did. Yes, but now they're going to go home uh, as a Sunday night favorite. And you know, I'll share this with you in my database. Favorites of six or more points on Sunday nights are terrible. Uh, they're very popularly bet by the, uh, by the public which Houston will be in this game. Okay. And the underdog just gets no respect, which Chicago is not getting here. The other side of the coin here, and I'm not going to make a big play because it's still Chicago, and I still think Caleb Williams is a fraud. But but you, what you have in Houston here is you have a team that went from last place in their division to first place yeah. in their division yeah. last year. And those teams make a U-turn and get right back to the middle of the pack the next year. Uh, it could happen if they don't win this football game here. They'll be a 500 team, and they'll be where? Right in the middle of the pack. The Philadelphia Eagle-Atlanta game, uh, I'm going to be on the Atlanta Falcons in this football contest here. And uh, if for no other reason, uh, 
I'm going to play a travel factor here, coming back from Brazil with no rest. Yeah, there you go. You know, <laughs> it's not easy, okay? It's an 11-hour flight, it's nine and a half hours if, if you own the airplane like your team owner does. But that's a burdensome flight to have to make something like that, to do just that. And in Atlanta, you got a team here that now they went from the straight up favorite loser in the first game. Now they go to the underdog in the second game. Those role reversals are really rather quite nice to the underdog. So com combine all that together here, I'll play Atlanta plus the points here. And I'll likely put a gun in my head, probably have to play Chicago, although I won't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, that's a good one too, to segue into the final segment, which is, uh, my top uh, options uh, for picks this week. Um, and you know what? I had two games I like this week, part of the wise guy contest that we do. Yes. And they were both in the NFL this week. And, uh, and, 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 and they're going to be the, the Colts and the Rams. And with the Colts, first of all, I didn't need to even hear what you said about Brazil. That was like, that's the, the, what, when you said that, it's like, Oh, all right, let's cherry on top. I like that. But <laughs> as soon as I heard, that Malik Willis was going to still be the guy throwing as the quarterback this week. I was like, forget it, Colts. I'm all in. Chipped in. Chips in. Because this guy has no right being on a football field, let alone starting. He is awful. He is good. He is just, a, he is the worst idea anybody had when they looked at him. He came from what Liberty and they thought, Oh, nice little guy that, that came from being a running back at Auburn. And now he's a quarterback at Liberty and uh, Mazan, I guess was there. Uh, and, no, it wasn't Mazan. It was, uh, what's his name? Uh, it was it. Uh, who's the other guy that always leaves his teams. Uh, I forget. Anyway, uh, you know who I'm talking about probably um, uh, the Liberty coach. Who was the ex Liberty coach? Um, where is Wait, he right now? Jamie oh, Chadwell. Oh, he's on, oh, he's on Auburn right now. The Auburn head coach. So, okay. uh, oh, anyway, Hugh, Hugh freeze, right? Hugh freeze. Yeah. So, uh, so all of a sudden, you know, you get these scouts and they think they're smart. You know, I'm going to show you how smart I am because this kid, he's always oh, electric when he gets his hands on the ball. Cause he was a running back, but that kid can't throw for crap. He is the he's the worst excuse for a quarterback that you're going to see on the field on Sunday, and if Lafleur can get this kid to look anywhere near like a NFL quarterback, you might as well, you know, I'll I'll bend the knee and he'll be God to me because this kid's terrible. So as soon as I heard that, I'm like, I'm all over the Colts. They're going to win this game unless. Yeah, they have three turnovers and uh, Green Bay runs for 200 yards, you know, one of those things. But I, I just, I cannot see an NFL team winning a football game with that kid at quarterback. Well, you know, we called this out in the write-up in the game here. And, you know, I know there was a big push to the Colts and I can understand why. And it's largely because of Malik Willis. In his National Football League career, Greg, he's thrown 27 passes. He's been sacked five times. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good percentage. Are you kidding me? <laughs> that means every 5.4 times he attempts to pass the football, he gets sacked. And that's uh, not because he has a bad offensive line either. No, it's because, because he doesn't he's know what to do the with ball the ball too long. Right. He doesn't know what to do with the ball. Yes. You know, so uh, believe me, if uh, if this plays out according to Hoyle the way it likely will, you'll be talking about another different Green Bay quarterback next week. I just, I you know, and they, they're going to they're gonna deserve it. They're going to deserve it doing what they're, what they did to, to, to put this kid in the spot. All right. And the other game is the Rams. Uh, and I was shocked that the Rams and still are uh, an underdog. And, um, uh, and then, especially when I looked at the trend, especially because first of all, I expected it to be the favorite. Then I looked at the trends and I was like, well, this is just beautiful. I mean, the Rams have won nine straight either at Arizona or in a neutral site game against the Cardinals straight up and against the spread by a 13 to two, 13.2 points per game margin. That wow. is utter destruction, utter. Uh, so just like sort of like we were talking about the bills is that you have a team that has dominated another team and you're making that team the favorite again. Go ahead. Give me the point and a half for the Rams. That's why I'm all over the Rams. And by the way, I just think they're a better team anyway. I know they got some banged up guys, but Puka Nakua is not going to be the reason that the Rams are going to lose to Arizona because he's not playing. 
Well, the Rams just might be one of those Dia, Dia dogs. Uh, I don't know if how long or how many times in a row they've beaten uh, Arizona, but I do know this. They have beat them 13 of the last 15 games. And I also know this, that if you take a look, uh, you're looking at an Arizona football team that in their last 15 division games is 2-13 and 13 against the spread. Uh, those two numbers collide directly like uh, two freight trains hitting one another. You've got the better team as the underdog here, and there's no doubt about that in my mind. And I wouldn't be surprised if the Rams win this football game comfortably. And by the way, the oh, Arizona is also four and fourteen against the spread. Their last eighteen is a home favorite. There you go. Nice. All right. So that's going to wrap it up. Uh, week two in the NFL. Week three in college football. Again, I want to remind everybody: check the link in the description for both the Playbook Magazine. I've been uh, presenting all of these trends right from here, and you also have the newsletter. Uh, that's where you can find things like uh, the incredible stat of the week. Uh, and so much more. I mean, I know I only bring up the incredible stat of the week and the awesome angle, but that's just two of many uh, awesome uh, weekly trends, stats especially, that you can find in the weekly newsletter, which I'll have a link in the description for as well, Mark. Awesome. Terrific. And, and anybody also, by the way, Greg, if they do want to subscribe to our newsletter, they'll also get my daily coffee club. That's an e-letter e that we send to all subscribers of the newsletter in your inbox every day through the Super Bowl with a lot of great stats and handicapping tips. Look forward to doing it again. And uh, don't forget, by the way, we are headed in just about 20 minutes recording time over to Playbook Experts YouTube channel to record uh, the weekly uh, Against the Spread podcast with Mark, uh, with Hall of Fame handicapper Jim Feist, uh, with the totals dude, uh, Victor King. Uh, so uh, it should be a lot of fun. We're doing that in just a little while. So uh, you can uh, mosey on over to the Playbook Experts YouTube channel as well after you're done, of course, uh, watching this show. We'll see you again next Thursday right here on the Arlads Football YouTube channel.